You're listening to Beyond the Stage from the Carpenter Performing Arts Center at Cal State Long Beach. In each episode, we introduce you to the artists, scholars, students, and arts professionals interpreting our world through the arts. Join us this week and every week this summer as we explore their stories. Let's get started. Uh, Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's episode. Uh, I have with me Dr. Ray Briggs. Thank you for being here. As a saxophonist, Dr. Briggs has worked with John Clayton, Jeff Clayton, Benny Green, and Rufus Reed. As Assistant Director of Jazz Studies at CSULB, he has coordinated the Jazz Combo Program and teaches jazz history and ethnomusicology courses. Dr. Briggs is also director of the Quincy Jones Jazz Camp and co-founder of FEED, which stands for Focus on Education, Equity, and Diversity at the Bob Cole Conservatory of Music at California State University, Long Beach, a bi-weekly forum that focuses on social justice, activism, and inclusion in the areas of music and music education. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today on the episode. Hi, Dr. Briggs. How are you today? Oh, I'm just fine. Thank you so much for having me, Olivia. Very excited to be here. Thank you. Good. Conversation. I'm so glad. Um, well, I want to get started with um, vi- uh, visual descriptions. Uh, hello, everyone. You know me. My name is Olivia. I am your host. I am a white woman with blue eyes. I have a pink and purple shirt on today, red lipstick, and turquoise headphones. And my visual background is the Carpenter Performing Arts Center. Dr. Briggs? Yes. So I am an African American male, um, and I am wearing uh, all black. Uh, I have medium brown skin. I think I have pretty nice brown eyes. And uh, I have a beard uh, that I recently uh, grew out. Um, and my background is my studio. Uh, I live in Pasadena, so this is where I kind of work and and practice and study and so forth and so on. Well, thank you again for being here with us today. I wanted to get started with just how are you doing? It's the end of the semester. How did the semester go for you? And are you excited to return to campus maybe next semester? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, One, the semester was, um, can I put it? Uh, There was a mad dash to the end. And uh, it's always like that, you know, and in some ways I get a kick out of that. I kind of like, you know, uh, short periods of intensity. I don't, I don't like long periods of intensity, but if I, if I, if I know, okay, over the next couple of days, it's going to be crazy, but by this date at this time, it'll be over. Yeah. If I can push myself to say, okay, cross that finish line and I enjoy the rest that comes on the other side of really hard work, right? Mm-hmm. In some ways I find that the rest isn't as sweet unless the hard work has come before it, right? Mm-hmm. If you're just kind of at home doing what you want to do, that can be very, very boring. Yeah. But if you've been really you know, like on a tight schedule and you got to get all these things done, then even just to sit in the backyard and read a book, is like, oh, wow, I can actually do this. But if you do that every day, it's like, oh, this is boring, right? This is there's nothing, there's no drive there. So I do appreciate the, the hectic, hectic quality of the, the scheduling. Um, but, you know, I am looking forward. Um, to getting back on campus. Although I have to say, there's some things I learned about my teaching and my connection to students that I would not have known had we not had this, this lockdown. Mm-hmm. In other words, I think there were some things that I, that I learned uh, that are positive, some benefits that I can actually continue to use and utilize. And I think we all have, like figuring out like what, what actually can work and, and how can we do this, even if things get back to normal, Right. What have we learned that can be maintained? I think that's, this is one of the few periods that I've had in my life like that, where everything really shut down. Yeah. We haven't had that. Um, and I think it allowed us to really kind of evaluate and take inventory, uh, maybe for- forcibly so. But uh, I think there's some there's some, some good in that. There's yeah. some good in it. And so I, I definitely think coming back to campus would be great because I do miss seeing people, right, and seeing students. And, and being a musician, there's certain things you can do online, but you can't, you know, Trying to have a concert or right. uh, hear students play, like no, online just won't work. It's just a, it's a, it's a nice substitute, but it can't uh, replace the real thing. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to getting back and seeing people and talking, just the energy. Yeah, right, yeah. It's very, very different. What are some of those things you think you'll take forward for with you this year into next year? Yeah, um, you know, in in my classes, I like to have a lot of discussions. Mm-hmm. I like to talk uh, and ask questions and have students ask questions. And I found that the online format, I mean, using Zoom, 
if this when the students have on you know their cameras you can see everyone they can all see you and at least visually they're all on the same playing field right uh it's not like a spatial thing where in the classroom these people are on the front row and these people are in the back and the ones in the front row get a lot of attention and the ones in the back you think well if they're sitting that far back they're probably not very interested in the material so i won't really engage so much so you don't really get that feeling. It's not, I'm looking at you all, and it seems like you all are in the same, you know, kind of same place and same space. Um, and so it feels to me a bit more like, you know, equal. Like the, the, again, I, I don't know some people speak well uh, on camera. Some don't. I, I'm aware of that. But I do feel like in some ways I had, I had more engagement in terms of students engaging. Uh, and it could be coupled with they, they have this need for connection that, you know, they've been at home. And so normally they would be on campus and they're talking to people, but now they're in, in the space every day, all day. And so when we have this class, it's one of the few times that they might get a chance to connect with people outside of the way where, they, where they're living. So there might be a greater need to, oh, let me ask a question. I've been thinking about them. We talk about these things. So um, I do think I want to maintain that in some way. How I'm going to do it in the classroom is yet to be, you know, maybe I'm thinking like a hybrid class where, you know, this, we have some very fixed days where we're on campus in person. And there's some days we're going to be online, right? Uh, where we can actually try to try to maintain that and see see how that fits in. But yeah, I think that's one area. Uh, the other is just being able to draw up in terms of technology. You can draw up things very quickly on the spot. You know, like I, I prepare certain things, but uh, I I teach. I try to teach a class somewhat uh, like I am playing jazz, right? Which means. As a jazz musician, you practice and you prepare. You don't just get up and like, oh, what are you going to play? I don't know. I figure that most jazz musicians don't do that, right? We we work up material, repertoire, and we have a list of things we're going to play. But in the moment, as we're playing it, something might lead us to a different place that we weren't prepared for, and we have to be flexible enough to say, okay, I didn't I didn't mean for this piece to turn into a say a bossa nova, but it seems like the rhythm is going there. Let's change it. Let's go this way. And so when I teach. I, to, it, maybe it's, it feels to me more exciting and more honest when I allow for that to happen. So if a student says something in response to a question or a prompt, and it leads me to think about something else, then I can very easily, you know, kind of okay. Let me show you this. And I look up something. On, look at this this uh, correspondence between this musician and that musician. I didn't have that in the notes before in the lecture outline, but in the moment it seems to be appropriate. So when I bring that in, it feels more like okay, I can do this. Of course, you can do that in the classroom, but I think it's a bit more awkward because you know, I'm, I'm standing up. And I have to walk back to my computer, say, hold on a second. But when I'm just sitting here talking to you, I could be looking something up and putting something in, and you don't see it until I screen share it. All right? Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of, and I like to have like a, a bit of a smooth presentation that way. But I just feel like in this format, I can do that much more easily. Yeah. So certainly that's another one. Yeah, I, I, it's so interesting. I've, I've talked to so many teachers over the, the last year, and I don't think anybody's brought up that how... You're the first to bring up how the kind of flattening of the classroom structure, the seating, and, and that's really interesting, almost really democratizes it in a way, mm, mm, which is, is really mm. fascinating. And I love the analogy of teaching to playing jazz music. And, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not a jazz musician, but I imagine your instinct is also a little bit off of like your fellow musicians and the audience, mm -hmm. um, much as it would be for like an actor on a stage, you, you're feeding off of that energy. And instead, you're feeding off of their students and their questions and what's, you know, you see that spark in them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. That's yeah. really and I, and I think the students get that. I think they appreciate it mm. when they know, OK, this is not a cookie cutter lecture that no matter who is you know, he's talking to, it's going to be the same thing. Like, no, I am in this place of thinking about this material as you are. I'm presenting it to you. So maybe I have a leg up, but I'm also thinking about it. And so when you say certain things to me that cause me to think differently about it, then hmm, I'm going to start to go on a different path and I'm going to take you on a journey with me as I start to learn more and, and, uh, and, and add more things to it. Uh, one of the, the biggest things that I try to get across to my students is that information, ideas, thoughts, especially the arts, they are more connected than they are separate. Mm -hmm. Like we, I think in, in the academic world, I think there's a lot of compartmentalization where, uh, think about I me, mean, with a campus, you have buildings that are dedicated to you know, a certain discipline. Like this is the sciences over here, the arts over there, 
music is there, dance is over here. And so I think while I understand why we do that, because we can really focus and like get the mechanics of that craft, I think there's also some detrimental parts to that. Mm -hmm. And that is that we don't think about it holistically. We think about it as a separate thing and in, into itself. But mm -hmm. when we look at it in the quote unquote real world, there are all these things that come to bear on that particular activity right. that relate across campus, right? But we aren't studying it that way. In the real world, it's happening that way. But we aren't really thinking about those connections. So in my classes, I have a lot of you know, objectives. One is, that let, me, let me give you some information that's going to you know, give you a kind of a basic understanding of what we're talking about. But let's not stop there. Let, let's, let's not just stop with, here's some facts. Memorize these facts. The test is on Wednesday, right? Like, no, that's not really education. To me, education is, think about how these things are influenced by and influence other things that might be seemingly unrelated, mm -hmm. right? Because if, if people are involved, it is by nature interdisciplinary. Sometimes we use that as saying, oh no, it's a special kind of interdisciplinary study. And like, well, actually life is interdisciplinary. Right. So it seems to me that would be the more common way of studying things because that's the way things are happening. Yeah. Uh, not this compartmentalized, but I think we, maybe because we're creatures of habit and that's how most educational models are set up that way. We come through high school, right, come through an undergrad degree, and that's what we're given. So when we're given the space to, if we become teachers, like, you know, like I'm a teacher, then I know how that works. I know how to enter that space. I know how to make, you know, play that, that, that game. But there has to be, I think, some kind of rethinking of, yes, maybe I got through this, but it, was that the best way of going about it? Right. Right. Are there other ways to, can I craft it some way that makes it more meaningful? Is there work that I had to do outside of my basic curriculum that made it meaningful to me? And if I can implement that work into my students' curriculum, then I think we're getting a little closer to, you know, you might say graduating, graduating them ready for the world, as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, here's some information, and you're going to have to really work to connect it to real life stuff. I right. think we kind of do that sometimes, and I, 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 I lament that. So I try to, in my classes, always talk about what's going on in the real world. Like, how, how is this reflecting what was going on at the time, if it's historical? How is it connected to what we see today? Right, because I think uh, when we don't do that, we don't really bring the richness that's obviously kind of at at the we're on the cusp of doing it. Mm. But unless you really connect those things, it, it it may seem like okay, that was nice. What's for lunch? What's for dinner? Right? right. Like there's no real. I think we can do better with that. So I try to do that as much as possible. Right, I can tell, and I I know you from working on the the Voices of for Justice series this semester. But you have such a passion for teaching, and and I see that um, I see that in you. And uh, I wish I I hope one day maybe I could sit in the back of one of your classrooms <laughs> and listen in. You know, absolutely. I think you can look back and often see how the arts has influenced culture and culture. The arts mm -hmm. we call it arts and culture. Mm -hmm. uh, the arts hold up a mirror to the world, but they also you know, are influenced by it yeah. and influence it back. And, mm -hmm. you know, that happens today too. So thinking about the interconnectivity. And I think that's one thing that will be nice for, for students and for everybody getting back to in-person events, being on campus. I remember, you know, being a student there myself and walking through the quad and seeing students work on a dance piece mm. and, you know, art students walking by with their easels and <laughs> just you're absorbing those things every day and they're influencing your life, but you may not know how yet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or what you're learning from your fellow students and definitely the breaking down the silos of yeah. the, the art forms is, is important. Those mm -hmm. interconnectivity of things. And absolutely. I, I want to talk a little bit about, about your, your teaching and what brought you to teaching. So I know you studied music education. What made you want to be a music educator and what brought you to being a, a, a professor and specifically a jazz professor? Um, well, when I was coming up uh, in high school, I went to a performing arts high school in Memphis and I began to study privately with a um, saxophone slash bassoon uh, a performer, a player. And he, he, encouraged me and instructed me, he said, you know, when you go to college and you major in music, he says, don't major in music performance. And his reasoning was not that music performance isn't a worthy pursuit, but his reasoning was, if you can play, it will show. Mm -hmm. Meaning, when you look at the professional music world, no one asks, excuse me, before you do this concert, do you have a degree? Right. 
but it's we know you're a great musician so here's a platform for you to share your art with you know uh and, I, and I'm saying this not to undermine the the the, the, uh, the degrees of performance. Those, I mean, those are important because they prepare musicians. But I'm just speaking of my own development. So mm -hmm. my my uh, uh, teacher said said, you know, don't get a music uh, performance degree. Get a music education degree because that will always be able to serve you, and it'll be, it'll be a part of your arsenal. Mm -hmm. Like you're a musician, and so many musicians teach. Most musicians teach. Not always like you know in a, in a tenure track you know position like what I'm what I'm doing, but certainly they they have students, they have people that they mentor. There's some kind of teaching going. All art has that kind of men. There's something that's built into it where you pass it along. People who are coming up come to you, or they watch you, or they ask you questions. Sometimes it's in a formal setting, sometimes it's informal. So by instructing me to do that, I thought, okay, I'm going to approach music in college as if I'm a performance major. So I'm going to practice like my, you know, performance, performance major classmates are doing, but I'm taking all these education classes in, in addition to that. And when I graduate, I'm going to say I have a degree in music education, but if you look at what I'm doing, I'm also playing. Right. Right. And so that, that's kind of how I got into music education in terms of teaching. Um, I started teaching, uh, actually in here in California. So I was getting my first master's degree in, in, it's funny that we're talking about this performance stuff. But I actually, I do have a uh, master's degree in performance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in woodwind doubling. So it's, uh, you know, flute, oboe, clarinet, saxophone, bassoon. Um, and while I was doing that degree at the University of Redlands, I was teaching for the community school. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, they, they kind of give students, grad students, uh, a stipend uh, to teach students in the community. So I would teach for, you know, different, I would teach clarinet and saxophone. Uh, I, think I, did, I think I did clarinet and saxophone. So I started teaching, but it's more like instrumental, like you know, individual uh, pieces. Um, but in terms of my, my academic teaching, that didn't happen until my uh, second master's degree. And that was not in music performance. It was in ethnomusicology. This was UCLA. And so what, when I'm there, it was very much, um, you know, it's kind of, in other words, that's kind, of, that's kind of the normal path. As an ethnomusicologist, most end up in professor, you know, kind of uh, roles where they're going to be teaching. So I kind of knew that would be there, but my, but my um, assistantship was uh, being a teaching assistant. So mm -hmm. I had to, you know, open the classroom, help with some of the grading. Uh, uh, so I was already kind of doing it, but it wasn't yet my passion. I think what helped me develop this, the passion and the skills was, one, seeing people do it on a high level. Mm -hmm. So one of my best uh, models uh, was my mentor at UCLA's uh, Professor Cheryl Keys, and she is incredible, and she you know really inspired me because uh, she, she was the first professor I saw who had the academic credentials, the knowledge, the and the passion, and the relatability. I hadn't seen that before. I mean, I, I've been I, I've I've had at that time two degrees. Right, I had a, my my mat, my bachelor's in music ed, first master's in performance. Now I'm in my second. And I had, I had never seen all those things converge in that way. And to be honest, it was like another world opened to me. So I'm thinking now, you mean you can actually talk about, and her specialty is African American music, right? And so I'm thinking, you can actually talk about African American music, and it's a profession, and you can teach it, and you don't have to water it down, and you can talk about all the things related to it, and it's real, and it's, and it's beautiful music, and it's endless, and I'm it's like, wow, I want to do that, right? Yeah. And so uh, she mentored me, and she really helped me kind of get my uh, materials together. But also just watching her, like just kind of like, kind of metaphorically sitting at her feet, watching her do it, and realizing, okay, I want to do this, right? And I want to do it on the level that she's doing it. Um, so from there, um, I actually got a call from uh, uh, University, um, Cal State University, San Bernardino. That was my first teaching mm -hmm. gig, and um, they just called up and said, "Hey, we have an African American music class. Is there anyone there that could teach it?" And um, they passed it to me and said, hey, you want, you want a gig? I said, yeah, sure. All right. <laughs> and they say the rest is history. So I started teaching there, and I really started to learn like, the skills of teaching. But what I try to do more than anything else is connect. Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes I think, like, like music, you can focus on the mechanics of teaching, you know, the nuts and bolts of it. How do you present? How do you prepare you know, PowerPoint slides? How do you, like testing, all those things you can, you can do. 
and it's, it's conceivable that you can do all the mechanics very, very well and miss the core of what teaching is about. But in the same way, as a musician, you can develop the mechanics of it, you know, all the technical aspects of playing the instrument, keeping it in tune, all the things you can develop at a very, very high level. But it's conceivable, and I've seen it, where there's no core. It's like there's, there's, there's rarely, I was speaking to someone earlier about this, about this today, I think sometimes in academia we focus so much on the mechanics of the craft in terms of the arts, in terms of music, mechanics of the craft. We don't spend a lot of time on the why. Why am I doing it? All right. And so as we're talking about the mechanics of it, uh, and of course that gets people playing well and performing well and all that, but the why, like what's the purpose behind you doing this art? What are you mm -hmm. feeling when you make it? What are you trying to get people to feel when you express it? And so when I'm teaching, I'm again, I'm kind of like I'm treating it like, you know, like jazz. And so it's this idea of I'm going to perform, I'm going to do it through passing information, and it's going to be flexible. But there's going to be a goal in mind, but how we get there might change from day to day. Right. right? It might be a little bit different each time, uh, and we're going to discover it together. So, you know, in terms of wanting to teach, I think I am more inspired to do it now than I ever have been. And some of it has to do with different events in, in, our, in our world, that, and the things that I think, you know, education can really serve a great purpose here because yeah. uh, you know, obviously what we know and, and what we think we know has an impact on how we see the world, how we see ourselves, how we engage in the world. So I'm not saying that it's an end all, you know, be all to like world peace. No, no, no. But some things people do that I think are harmful to themselves and their communities out of ignorance. Mm -hmm. There's some things they do and some things that they might think because they haven't heard or been exposed to ideas that would help them expand their view and not, you know, just kind of act in a way that, that shows uh, limited understanding and, uh, and sensitivity. Like, so I really feel like, you know, education and teaching, I can demonstrate that and demonstrate it in a way that inspires students to look beyond the veneer of individual people that they might meet. Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, being a so-called black man, uh, I know that not, I mean, I'm, I'm not singling out any particular students. But I, I know being an African-American, teaching primarily non-African-American, non-so-called minority students, that there might be some, um, you know, stereotypes that students enter the space with. There might be some beliefs about who I am as a so-called black man. And so I, I'm very aware of that. And I am not trying to project onto them any kind of beliefs. But I know that when I enter this space, there are some ways that I think, there are some ways that I see the world that many of them have never been exposed to. And the, the danger is they're going to go out into the world and make decisions about what is right, what is wrong, like what is what is justice, what does that look like? Because all those things are informed by our life experiences, education, right? It all plays a role. So I feel more inspired because I think, you know, I need to play my part. Mm -hmm. Being in a band, I got to play my part. I got to practice it, get it ready, all right? And I have to be fearless in presenting it. I, I can't sit back and just kind of rest in the mechanics of presenting because I may never get to what I what really is the core. And I think the, the hardest thing is feeling this this purpose in myself for being too fearful to, to show that to my students. Like in my earlier years I was kind of that way. You know, but now I feel more like, you know, you know, the the world is happening and time is moving on, whether I jump in the fray or not. So if I am really trying to make a difference, there's there's more required. There's more required. I can't just dial it in. I can't, you know, uh, I have to really be, be on it. And I need to tell students what I think is, you know, helpful, but also truth and trying to make them more understanding human beings. Right. Some of that's informational. A lot of that is also listening to stories, you know, re mm -hmm. really listening and not just I watched the news or I saw some, someone on, on social media and they told me this. Like, yeah, but what do you really know? And how do you know what you know? So I think for teaching, for me, it's like it, it's like a it's like a, un, a never ending gig. Well, I mean, eventually it's going to end, but you know what I mean. Like it's a it's a, it's a long long term gig, right? And uh, and I can I can approach the audiences and kind of give them what I think is important, and get feedback from them, and then come back somewhere. It's great because I'm because I, I'm growing. That's the mm -hmm. that's the short of it, right? I'm growing. I think as I grow, I can give them more, and I'm excited yeah. to see how will I grow the next year two years, three years, four, five years from now, right? I am in anything but stagnant, right? I, I, I don't want that. As a jazz musician, I don't want to be stagnant. As a professor, I don't want to be stagnant. 
Mm. I, I want to be, you know, ever expanding. So that's kind of how, how I got there and why, why, I'm, why I'm passionate about it and how I try to stoke that fire. Wow. Yeah. Oh, it, it, it's interesting because, you know, I, I love your story and, and your, your approach to, to education, but arts education in general, I mean, studies show continually that music education, arts education in schools from a young age can build empathy and increase, you know, test scores, intelligence, connectivity to a community and one's history, yet it is often the first thing to go. Mm-hmm. And if it's doing all these things, if it's, if it's really creating better communities and better citizens, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, better people, why, yeah. why is it the first thing to go? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's... You know, <sighs> it's, it's an interesting point. In, in part, you know, when I think about that, you know, I feel like in, in our lives, no matter what our backgrounds are, there are some things that shape us and some things that are very meaningful and even powerful in our lives that we haven't yet taken inventory of, mm. right? They're there and they're doing their work, but we just haven't put any, put in, you know, kind of put any thought on it or you know, just, you know, described it in any way. And sometimes I think when we don't have that kind of introspective look at, our, at ourselves to really figure out, okay, why am I the way that I am? How did this happen? What do I like and what do I not like? And how do I see the world and why do I see it that way? When we don't do that kind of work, and it's like someone else or something else tells us what's important. Right? And then we get in the world where they say, well, the important thing is the bottom line. Well, how much money is it going to make? Right? Okay, yeah, I guess in a world where, you know, exchanging goods and services, and there's money involved. Yeah, you have to know something about that. But what happens when that becomes the main focus? What happens when how much money you make is the, the supposedly the arbiter of your quality of, of humanity? What happens when we get to that place, right? So I do think where we are now in part is that um, people are looking at the bottom line. And since they haven't, many of them haven't thought I think, deeply about what do the arts mean to us as human beings? You know, sometimes I think, I think we take cues, I, mean, I think we take cues and kind of leadership from the wrong people. Let me say it mm-hmm. that way. People that haven't been in touch with this part of their humanity, even though it might have done that work for them, they haven't really thought about it. Yeah. But I, honestly, I believe that music as one of the arts does this to practically everyone. I think everyone connects. That's the music that speaks to you, and you feel connected to it. And when you hear it, you're even. I'm not a scientist, but maybe your your, your molecular structure even changes while you're listening to it. Something happens, and we know that. Yeah. Some mm-hmm. might say it's psychological. Some might say it's spiritual. Something happens when you hear some music that you you connect with. Mm-hmm. So we all have it, but we don't. We don't. You know. We don't. We, we want. We don't quantify it. So maybe that's not like a hard science. If you hear this piece, you're going to have it. And some there's some attempts to look at what's going on in the brain. But we don't really say, well, this piece is worth this much. And this piece. We don't do that. We do commodify it, right? We do have like a sense of we're going to sell you this. But I think we don't talk about that and the power of it. So mm-hmm. that if it doesn't have this bottom line, like uh, very easily identifiable, you know, contribution, then we think that it's you no know, no consequence or we can do without it, right? Uh, it's like, you know, we, we breathe air every day. But how many of us think about air? How, how many of us think about the quality of air. I mean, we, we watch the news, they might say tomorrow's going to be really bad, so you don't want to go outside. We, but we don't really do it on a daily basis. And so that, and that's the most important thing that we you know we need. Mm-hmm. So there's no thought on it, right? We kind of assume that's going to be there. And, and so I, and I think with, with, the, with the arts, it's one of the most important things that humans can make. You know, it's good think about it. I mean, when I talk to young people, no matter what background they have, there is some music that they see themselves in that this music speaks to them and for them, and that's their jam, and that's how they grew up on that. And, that's, and they believe in this music very much like a religion. Mm-hmm. That if you said to them, uh, this music is, uh, is dumb, or it's not good, or you're an idiot, they feel highly offended. Right? If you say, you like that, but if I say to you, wow, that's really, I, I know what you mean, that's some beautiful music, now we're friends. Right? You don't know me. But because I identify as something that you also value, music, now you're open. We can talk. We can hang out. Right? So what is that? Yeah. And, and in some ways, I think music does it. And I say it's like a religion. But I think music even does it more in some ways than religion. Right? You think about you know, the, the, all the various religions of the world. And sometimes there are these you know, compartmentalized views. 
that don't allow people who supposedly are of the same faith to come together. So what keeps them apart? If you say, I believe the same thing you believe, then why aren't we together? But if I say, I like this music, you like it too, we can get in that space. Like, what is that? Like, the music allows us to, like, you know, bridge that gap in that way. So I, I do think the arts is, you know, we, we are told, we are told the arts don't matter. Or we are told there's a, uh, uh, a hierarchy. First, take care of this and this and this and this. And there's something left over, then deal with the arts. Mm-hmm. Right? First, eat. You know, uh, get some shelter. Uh, you know, there's a whole kind of, oh, and, then, and then if you've got time and effort, it might be nice to throw in the arts. So I wonder where that model comes from. I'm sure mm-hmm. if you study Western history, you probably see when it entered. Yeah. Right? And, and, and it was seen as, I'm just thinking generally, but I think, I think it was seen as a uh, kind of like an icon of my socioeconomic status. Right. Right. If I have the money, oh, look, I study music. I do a little bit of this. It shows that I am well versed. We say well rounded. Right. Right. But it's not at the core of who I am. It's just something that I do to show, look, I got some time, leisure time and money. I think I'll play the piano. Right. And so it has some of that. So sometimes we follow that model. And even though those of us who know that music does more or other arts do more, we aren't necessarily so vocal about it until we feel the pressure. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I do think as artists, we have to be more proactive. Like we can't wait for you know, the axe about to fall to cut us off. And we say, oh, by the way, the arts are important. No. Right? I'm not saying it's too late, but it's harder right at that point. Right. <laughs> right? It's harder at that point. Yeah. So how do we yeah. put that at the forefront? How do we influence, you know, this is kind of cliche, but how do we influence the influencers? So it's really something that we can, we can really work on and, and try to make that more, uh, more part of the conversation. Right? Knowing that we are inclined and prone to think this about the arts. What do we do about that? Are we, are we just sitting ducks, you know, waiting for it to, it might fall, it might not? Or do we say, no, we're going to create a climate around us that makes that much more difficult to happen? You know, and it's kind of like thinking in survival mode all the time. Yeah, there may, maybe there's some, maybe some cons to that, but you know what I mean. That's this idea of knowing that we're on the chopping block first. How do we always, how do we present ourselves so this doesn't happen so easily to us? Mm-hmm. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I want to talk a little bit about the FEED program, uh, Focus on Education, Equity, and Diversity. This was, and correct me if I'm wrong, a new program that you started at Bob Cole in the last year. And I think it very much ties into to what you were talking about um, just a few moments ago about this is something that needs to be in the water. It needs to be something that's integrated into what we are breathing in the air and it's not right now. So how, how is that shifting? So can you talk a little bit about, about the program, what, what you're doing through feed and what it is and what you hope to achieve or what we are trying to yeah. achieve with it? Sure. Absolutely. So, you know, first I want to, I want to you know, make sure I give credit that you know, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders. Okay. So there's several professors, uh, Professor Alicia Doyle, uh, Professor John Palkey, Professor Christine Guter. Uh, so there are four of us who started talking about, you know, it was it, really, it was in response to, and then, you know, after the, the murder of George Floyd, and, you know, a lot of people think the whole country, some even say many parts of the world, were just, you know, on this high, heightened sensitivity of, hey, something's not right. And and not only is this, and, and it wasn't, what's beautiful about this period is, it wasn't just singled on this one event. It wasn't like, you know, we need to not uh, allow black people, especially black men, to be shot down the street or killed in the street and nothing happens. But it seemed like, even though the discussion wasn't necessarily that, that uh, it wasn't that clear, it seemed like people understood we can do all kinds of things in the spirit of correcting this wrong. That is not just, we're going to make sure that police don't kill. No, no, no. That, sure, that's, a, that's the kind of the, you know, the symptom part. But there is something that leads us as a society to this way of thinking about black people. And so this program was, it was a forum. We, every two weeks we'd have a different presenter and we were doing it as our, you know, kind of Bob Cole conservatory response to what does it mean to be just and equitable and, and you know, and, and, and uh, represent the diversity of our students and the community that we serve? How do we do that in the arts, right? In, in, in music. So, um, you know, it, it was, it's interesting because it was a, it was a time when I think a lot of students were, we're wondering, well, what can I do? You know, what can I do? Like, I see this is not right. And, and going back to my early years of teaching, 
I remember sometimes when I would have these conversations, you know, it's interesting how at different points of history, certain conversations don't do what they will do later. Like I could talk about some of these things and sometimes you know, certain, certain students would be like, you know, uh, yeah, okay, we, uh, we know that. Or uh, why are we talking about that? It's the second claim. But now that where we are in America's history, I can talk about those same things and students are like, yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Now I understand. So it's like, it's kind of like, you know, I'm not saying I'm ahead of the pack, but there's like kind of time caught up, you know, kind of time caught up. So I think we are primed for the conversations. And so I have to say that I am very uh, pleased that our department has carved out a space for us to do this because in my, all my years of, of being here, it hasn't existed. It hasn't existed. And I'm not saying that there's opposition against it, but it just was, it, it didn't seem to be a desire for it either. Right. And so I think this all the pain that we saw with the murdering of George Floyd, that there are many people, you know, black and otherwise, who are saying, you know, we have to do what we can to change this climate. So every two weeks we'd have a presenter and uh, we had you know, I actually did the first one presentation. It was on African-Americans or people of African descent in classical music. You know, so And the reason I you know, started with that is I thought, you know, let me think about my audience. Uh, as, as, as beautiful as you know, the Bob Coke Conservatory of Music is, it is very much slanted towards Western classical music. And that's no fault. I mean, it's not, I'm not singling them out. I think most uh, college you know, music programs are that, kind of de facto. Like, you know, if you're going to study music in college or university, you don't ask, well, which music are you going to study? It's like, you no, know, if you're studying music, it's going to be Western classical. Uh, of course, we have jazz, but I think you know, jazz is a... Is, uh, a much newer form to be studied, and uh, and certainly if you look at the weight that's placed on how much jazz you're studying, even as a jazz major, there's like a, a precursor of classical grounding before you get into jazz. So it's like, you no know, classical stuff is well represented. So I'm thinking, how can I make the students aware that black folks have done other things? And again, it's like, like I'm mindful of how African Americans are presented in media forms, you know, movies, TV, so forth, so on, how they're misrepresented. And so when I'm teaching a group of students, not only am I giving them information, but in many ways I am working against those ideas. Right? So I have to understand the battlefield, like where the, where are they coming from? And how much of this have they thought about? So when I when I'm when I did the first one, I thought, okay, let me deal with Africans in a field that they're already familiar with. Like they studied Western classical, how it developed, went from, you know, monks doing it to like, you know, now composers are doing it. And they know that. But how much did they hear people who are, you know, African-Americans doing it or people of African descent doing it? Probably not that much. Right. So let's now let's expand what they know, or what they think they know already. Let's start there. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to inspire them to say, you know, huh, I never knew that as much as I've had classes in this. They never talked about some of these people before. And the next question is, why not? And I'm not asking the question, I'm saying once they learn it, hopefully it generates, you know, hmm, I'm now, you know, in my undergrad degree, I've been studying for you know, four, five, six, seven years. Why well, haven't I heard this stuff before? Right. And if it's happening here, might it have happened in my general history class as well? Might it have happened in how we talk about politics and sports and the whole, in other words, uh, is there this lack of representation in other areas? And if so, what effect in terms of totality, what effect does that have on me? If I don't see black people except on the 11 o'clock news getting, you know, choked out or shot down or, you know, uh, seen as criminals, what, how does that affect me and how I see black people? It has to have an effect, right? It must. And so this kind of inventory, like, you know, that I'm talking about, I think it's an, it's, it's an imperative. We must have, if education is to be anything at all, it must be introspective. There has to be this look at, you know, where am I coming from? What have I learned? And it's not a, it's not a, good or bad thing. It's like being honest about, like, did I see any people outside of my community, outside of people who look like me? When I did, how did I see them? Like, what, is, what has been my real life experience? What has been my education? What has been my even just, a, uh, you know, kind of encounters, if I have any at all? And if I don't, you may ask, well, why didn't I? So I, at the end, I think that kind of work, we don't, I don't think we really foster it. And the result is that we send people out into the world, this I think is the dangerous part, thinking that they are well aware. And as I say to my students all the time, whether you think you, you, you have it or not, you all wield influence. You all have it already. Some of you are going to go on to have more influence. You're going to become a director of some program, leading some orchestra, being a professional musician. So what you think about these issues matters. Right? Because people are going to follow what you say. 
And if you aren't thinking about these things, guess what? It's probably not going to change. So one, are you really taking inventory? Are there things that you think we can do better? If we are really equitable and fair, you know, a lot, a lot of universities, colleges, you know, I, I joke about this, but uh, if you look at most college and universities' websites, just, just pick one. I think it's a, it's a general kind of approach. Usually it's something like this. You will see the landmark of the university or the college, wherever that is. could be the clock tower, you know, some kind of something that this identifies the space. And in front of it will be standing an African-American student, a white student, a Latinx student, you know what I mean, like the Asian student. We're all welcome. Come on in. I said, okay, that sounds great. It looks great on the, on the website. But what I want to see, let's look at the curriculum. In other words, it's what, now, again, given our history, that is a step forward. That's, pro, that's progress. Because some of our institutions, many of our institutions were not welcoming to non-white people. So the very fact that we're saying, hey, this space is open, that's a great message. But I'm saying, let's not stop there. If you can say, we're diverse in terms of who we serve, that's cool. But once we get them here, what are we teaching them? How diverse is the curriculum? And if we're going to take it a step further, how diverse is who? In terms of the fact, who's teaching them? If we say representation matters, do kids see people like them teaching with authority? But if they don't, the, the tacit message is, this is information for you to take, not information for someone like you to give. Right? It's, it's, it's pretty clear. If you work your way up to administration, how diverse is that? Now, again, I'm not calling on any one institution, but I'm saying in my years of being a student and teaching, I've seen it. And again, what I've noticed is they usually, maybe it's like a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, it's some, in some ways it's like tooting our own horn, but it's like, it's a buzzword, like you know, diversity. Oh, we're going to be diverse. Sounds great. Especially in Southern California, we say, oh, we're a diverse community. That is true. But diversity can also be seen or not seen within the power structure. That's where the work has to be done, I think. That's where we are now, right? But we have to keep pushing. We have to keep pressing. We can't wait for those in power to say we have arrived, right? And so I think what we see now with George Floyd, I know I'm watching this thing, and I'm thinking, you know, it's great that we have this, you know, feed is wonderful, and I want to see it continue, and I want to see, you know, kind of energy, but I, I, I just wonder, you know, like, will people stay committed? Very honestly, like, will, uh, when things snap back to normal, Will they be as, you know, will they feel the urgency? And I, I think just being, you know, how humanity works, there'll be some that'll stay in the fight. There'll be some who won't. So knowing that we got to strike while the iron is hot, we have to build momentum so that, you know, if things start to trail off a little bit, there's enough critical mass that we keep it moving, that we keep going forward, right? And we make it a regular part of the discussion, not, oh, look, another black man got shot. Oh, let's have, a, let's talk. No. No, no, let's, this, is, this is who we want to be. And it, and it needs to not just be, again, I don't want to make it just about black people. It needs to truly be about the diversity of our communities. And are we focused on that? In other words, do we think we're doing our jobs well when we lack diversity at these various levels? Do we feel like we're doing it well? I think, unfortunately, that decision is not left up to a diverse group of judges. Right? So then the people who are saying we have crossed the line don't represent the diversity that supposedly we're serving. That's a problem. That, that, that I say is a problem. So we have to figure out how to, to keep addressing that. I think it's, it's logically, you could, it makes sense. It's pretty clear. Just looking around and saying, okay, here's the community. Do we see that in the student body? Check. Do we see that in the faculty? Mm. Do we see that at the administrative level? Mm. So those are power structures. Right? So how do, how do we expect to get to this diversity that we're talking about if the student kind of diversity, if it stopped at the student level? Yes, students have power, but they don't have the kind of power to change university the way faculty and, you know what I mean? So it, 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 there's, a, there's a, a real thorough look we have to make at the, at the very top and make this conversation. So I think for, the, the feed forum allows us to deal with it at the student level, and it also allows faculty to see that we're very active. And again, I'm very, I'm very happy about it because it's, it's a space, to be honest, I never thought I would see. I have to be very honest, I never thought I would see uh, an ongoing forum that allows us to get, get to some of this. In my classes, I try to get to it, but I'm only one person. And, uh, you know, I try to Im implement as best I can, but given the subject matter. I can't just, you know, go on a tangent. I have to keep it, you know, in, in the subject matter. But given that this is an open space, we've had, you know, presenters from the Long Beach Opera, Dr. Uh, Durrell uh, Akon, who presented on, you know, Africans in Opera. Um, and we've had uh, a great you know, uh, 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 classical musician, uh, bassoonist, uh, Dr. Garrett McQueen, 
he came in talking about African Americans in the symphony orchestra, like and the lack of representation, all these things. And so it's like we have this place to really get at some some things that we don't normally cover, right? And so making it a more regular part of our, who we are as a black folk conservatory, I think it's in line with what we say our mission statement is, right? Now we're just making it, you know, look at this. And if anyone asks, why are we doing this? Why are you doing this? We haven't done this before. But this is what we say we are. This is what we say we are. We, we, we're actualizing what we put what we put on paper. And now we're going to hold ourselves accountable to this. Right? I think that's, that, that's, to me, that's the next step. Uh, I know it's, it's a bit long, but I think when I, I connect this, I'm not talking about connecting dots, I connect this to, you know, when we look at our country, and so many of us see that there's a lot of work yet to be done. There are some who think we've already crossed the line. The threshold has been met. There's no more slavery. Uh, segregation is no longer a part of our laws. What are you complaining about? There are some that say, you know, uh, now it's it's just you and, you're, and it's based on merit. If you do what you're supposed to do, you'll get it. Not realizing that, I mean, one, that shows to me the lack of true understanding of how we actually got here. You're talking about 246 years of slavery, 12 generations of free labor, Jim Crow after that, segregation, that, and to this day it's still happening. But here's where I think it gets tricky. There's no name for it. I mean, if you say, hey, look, this is slavery. Oh, okay, wow, this is terrible. And look at this. Here's some laws, uh, segregation laws since 1896. Oh, yeah, that's awful. But what happens when it's no longer in, on paper? Now you need some, some you know, heightened sensibilities and honesty to look at in conversation to say, okay, the America that I'm getting, are you getting that same one? Because if you aren't thinking outside, you say, look, I don't see any problem. Why? Because there's no laws. Nothing's holding you back. Like, what's stopping you? And so these conversations and education, I think we can really get to that place. But I think when presented with information and the stories, many people outside of the so-called minorities that are affected mostly by it get it. Many understand it and say, okay, uh, it, 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 was, it was a terrible event, but I, am, I was very encouraged with the, what seeming was like the national response to the George Floyd you know, kind of you know, uh, fiasco. It's like, okay, it's like, okay, there's hope. If, if people are touched in this way where they're going to move, no matter what the motivation, maybe it's morality, maybe it's their religious beliefs, maybe it's an, for, for a corporation is to, you know, stay in business. I don't know what, what brought them here, but whatever it did, let's figure out how to maintain it. It shows that there is some way of moving this thing forward. So uh, I'm very happy that we can do it, and I'm hoping that it's going to, um, who knows, maybe we can model it for others. Other universities will see this. Maybe we can talk to the CSU and say, hey, look, do what we're doing in Long Beach, and it worked. What if we replicate this in, throughout the, you know, the, our 23 campuses yeah. and talk about how to do this? And eventually it's not like a side thing. It's actually in the curriculum. That's the goal, right? Where it's not just a, where there's a class in this and it's a required class and everyone's going to go through this. So, you know, I think that's working. I'm excited about the future because I think we can get there. But um, yeah, this feed form, I think is one step. And it's, like I said, I'm, I'm very uh, excited about it. I want to see it move forward and but I'm also very honest about it as well. So I think that's we have to be excited and honest, right? At the, at the same time. Yeah, it's a starting place, but it's not the finish line. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Beyond the Stage is produced by the Carpenter Performing Arts Center at Cal State Long Beach. Views expressed by guests of the show or the host are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of the university. A special thanks to today's guests and to the entire staff of the Carpenter Performing Arts Center, including our executive director, Megan Klein Crockett. Audio engineering is provided by Kembo Prey, graphic design by Patty Laurel, digital communications by Franz Newman, and additional marketing and media assistance by Amber Legaspi Valdez. Our theme music is by Kembo Prey. If you'd like to support Beyond the Stage or the Carpenter Performing Arts Center, please visit us online at carpenterarts.org. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.